Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Hard Talk HR. I'm your host, Mihai Nagy. My guest today is Nigel Barlow. Nigel is an author, an agent provocateur, a futurist, an innovation subject matter expert, and many of you met Nigel as he was and he is the chairperson of the HR Congress conference series. Nigel and I, we try to explore and talk about the natural reaction in times of crisis, cost cutting, and usually trainings and funds for innovation suffered. So we explore if this is the right thing to do, if this is the smartest thing to do, and if not, what are the possible alternatives? We also covered rethink, rebuild, rebound. What are the right HR responses in times of crisis? And this is Nigel's methodology, how HR can be a source of value when it comes to dealing with turbulence and dealing with crisis. And last but not least, I spoke to a futurist, so naturally the question I ask, what is the future look like after the post-pandemic era? So if you like today's episode, just don't forget to hit the subscribe button and I hope you will enjoy. At Heart Talk HR, we bring you fresh ideas and inspiring content from around the world of work. So Nigel, so good to have you here. Thank you so much for accepting yeah. my invite to come to this interview. And, and the, the reason way. why I wanted to speak with you because you are an agent provocateur. You helping organizations to innovate. You helping organizations to go through transformation and disruptions. And these days we are living the most disruptive times uh, ever probably anybody experiences. So. I wanted to have a chat with you and wanted to have your point of view, especially right. when times are tough. Um, it's a natural tendency for organizations to cut costs, to optimize costs, to save on expenditures as much as possible. So naturally, innovation funds, training expenses are the first to go. So what is your viewpoint of that? Well, I think the first thing to say is who is saying this? Who is answering this? I always say that never ask a barber if you need a haircut which in lockdown we all do and never ask an optician if you need glasses so i'm in the business like you of coaching people developing talent speaking at conferences i'm bound to say don't cut your budget but just don't listen to my anecdotal view there's a lot of research to show that organizations that care for trust develop upskill their people actually perform better commercially they may all be taking a big hit you all may be taking a big hit right now but there's going to be a rebound probably sooner than we think and i think that many of the skills that people will need are fresh and actually need an injection of investment now just stuff like how to run virtual teams how to manage remote workers from home how to keep people's spirits raised and to realize that there still is a rosy future for an organization this takes more resource not less how about innovation i mean is this a good time to obviously we come back to a new reality a new reality we never experienced before i've just read today that today we are living 2050 in terms of digital transformation so it just expedited digital transformation so much yeah. so well, Disruption, yeah, you're talking about there, Mihai, if I'm right. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I talk in ordinary times about disruption and it all seems rather tame now, I have to be honest, because the whole globe has been disrupted by, by this pandemic. But I think what's needed is both innovation, which is doing things differently, uh, new approaches, but also creative adaption which is improving what already exists so the innovation might not be so much new products it might be new business models new organizational structures new kind of relationships in the world of work could you give us a few tips like practical ideas in today's times what is the best way to look at innovation uh garage innovation now everybody is like you know working in a a separate in a home office in isolation how can we innovate when we work virtually and we don't necessarily meet each other so often 
Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because garage innovation is a theme that I work with. The idea that in close physical proximity, you're able to break a lot of those silos in thinking, silos in the business, and really co-create together. Now, funny enough, that is beginning to happen virtually. I think that we need to reframe many of these expressions that we use to describe the current crisis. And one of them is social distancing. It's not social distancing, it's physical distancing. And this gives us the opportunity to build stronger and stronger virtual networks who will help you innovate. Look, we can now contact experts, speakers, coaches all around the world, bring them into our team, be quite intimate with them, albeit without touching. If you like, it's high tech, but no touch and make them part of our desire to invent a more successful future. So garage thinking is a mindset, a state of mind. It means let's experiment with the new, let's prototype, let's fail fast, let's try things out. And in the current environment, you can't help but do that if you want to survive. And I'm so happy you mentioned social uh, distancing because I just had a conversation the other way other day with Ricardo Troiano from Syngenta. Uh, the viewers can look it up now on our playlist. And we did talk about what he said at Syngenta, what they are experiencing is that actually it's it's remote, it's physical distance, but socially and, and emotionally more connected than ever. So while of course it's a tragic situation, a lot of good stuff is coming out from this pandemic uh, on the other hand in terms of learning from ourselves, learning from our organizations, how we work and how we operate. And I think that's right. I mean, it's too glib now to say, like the superficial positive thinker, it's not a problem, it's an opportunity. No, it's not, people are dying, it's a real problem. We have to take it absolutely seriously. It's unprecedented. But at the same time, the blind spot we all have, I call this the perception blind spot, is that when things are down, it's hard to imagine what it's like when they're up. And when things are up, we can never see a downside. And we may have been down, but this is the time to start rethinking what your business is going to look like as you emerge. And there's another word that's used about the crisis. I would encourage people and encouraging my clients to rethink or reframe. The word is isolation. A better word is hibernation. Hibernation means when the animals or now the humans kind of go to sleep, switch off their outside activity, something is developing, something is growing. So when the real spring comes, we can literally spring forward more effectively. Mm. So just this way, of reframing, not social distancing, but virtual networking, not isolation, but hibernation, and not lockdown, but breakthrough. This is a time we can be going into our own personal garage, our own creative self, and actually coming up with breakthrough ideas. We're getting quite philosophical, but I, I must agree with you that our own thinking determines the outcome. So if we if we look at it only as a problem, we'll never we're going to focus on a problem. We'll never 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 notice the opportunities. And you do have a very cool approach to the role of HR in in crisis, in the role of HR in managing disruptions and turmoils. This rethink, rebuild, rebound model. Can you tell us about that in a few yes, words? Yes, I, I think rethink, first of all, we're all being forced to, I wrote a book called Rethink a few years ago. It was, a, it was either ahead of its time or it was the wrong time, I don't know. But the thing was that we are now all being forced to creatively rethink. And I guess HR very much um, is, I, I guess, in the spotlight even more in these times. Because to rebuild a business means rebuilding the talent, the confidence, the trust, yes, of external customers and users, but people's hope and belief that they have a job, they have a future, their business has a future. And I think a simple way of characterizing the role 
that I think HR now needs to play is to be alchemists, not wizards. Let me explain. A wizard is brilliant at, say, putting in an executive development program or a new reward structure, whatever the great things HR does. But when they leave, have they left a legacy? An alchemist is not someone who turns base metal into gold, or if you can do that, we can all, all go home now, but it's somebody who doesn't just change people, but gives them the tools to change themselves. And I think this is so critical. We're working in a world where we've moved again, another reframe from experts and relying on experts to do it yourself. You know, we're doing a lot of the own jobs at home that otherwise we'd have outsourced to experts. We're perhaps not so cash rich, but we're more time rich. And how does that play into the world of HR? It's precious time that has to be used to help people to help themselves. More, if you like, the role of HR as encouraging do-it-yourself as well as providing expertise, sure, when it's needed. I'm talking myself out of business here, but I think this is exactly where HR needs to be. I don't think you will talk yourself out of business. You have still plenty of things to do because it's, it's not just HR's response. In fact, probably it's even more so. It's not HR's responsibility to implement the advice you advocate, but there's a significant role mid-managers and senior leadership plays in, in, in having the right message and echoing the right message across the organization. So where would you see, how would you see a management and HR relationship in terms of creating the tools and advocating these ideas and just making sure that uh, the, the right leadership messages are, are implemented across the organization. Well, you, could, you, you said earlier that we've been talking philosophy, getting a bit philo philosophical. And I've always understood and worked with the idea that there's two ways to transform an organization or two essential ingredients, philosophy and plumbing. And you need both. The plumbing is that HR can help line management to build its virtual teams around real business challenges or what i often call the beautiful question i'm being asked at the moment to say you know what is the real question that virtually online with our teams at a distance but psychologically intimate what really are the questions that we need to be answering how to rebuild faith in the future how to keep people's eyes raised, how to stop people being unusefully anxious about the current situation in the world. And I think the role therefore is not to do too much just training and just inputs and just keynotes, but real working sessions with smaller groups that HR facilitates to help people go away after the session, think about those challenges, and come back with their real prototype solutions. More and more, people are gonna to have to be invested in inventing the future of their own business. And you need to give them something practical as a challenge to tackle. I hear words, prototyping, small group, yeah. experimenting. Yeah. This is all like a foundation for an agile organization. So yeah. do we see that the current sort of a turmoil, it's actually expedite the adoption of agility? Yes, I think so. I think it's, you know, what's the oldest phrase in innovation? Necessity is the mother of invention. And it, nobody wants a war, but in a time of war, innovations in social structures, in technology, they really, and this has been a bit like a war, but hopefully huh, this time, of course, the enemy in a way is within, it's an invisible, uh, invisible disease. But this is a time when all the things that were happening anyway are accelerated. The drive to virtualization, to different forms of working, to agility, as you say, in turning around the organization, as I think you have done with yours, within a month or two, um, it's accelerated what was on the drawing board anyway. 
And I don't know if, and also in terms of leadership, because I don't know if there is a causation, but it's certainly a correlation in countries where there is a female leader. They seem somehow tackling this crisis way better than a male counterpart. Yes, it's interesting this. You've reminded me of something uh, saying from years ago um, is that a lot of organizations used to be very he. He standing for hyper expansionist. And now more and more are becoming she, sane, humane, ecological. It's a simple sort of way, way to remember that. And, and, and I think that's extremely healthy. I would say to the uh, us poor white males, this is not necessarily um, about the outer appearance. This is about the kind of thinking that intuition, that ability to speak more directly, to tackle the problem face on, not deny. Those seem to be uh, positive aspects of, uh, let's say, a feminine outlook. They're, they're not exclusive to women um, that organizations are beginning to adopt. I see a lot more um, compassion for employees, the sort of stuff many organizations had as a slogan for years, we care for our employees. Well, show me. And I think a lot of that is now being shown with the care packages, the support, the counseling that employees are getting. Yeah, maybe it is more feminine. Let's have more female leaders. I 100% I support it. I mean, I have three daughters at home, so you can imagine I'm the minority. I'm the minor we had a cat, we have a cat. Yeah. He, she used to be a boy, but you know, things happen. <laughs> so I'm the only one here, but I support it because I, I, it's, it's a totally different uh, relation relating to each other in a, in a much more she way. And I think that's, that the world, world needs that. Uh, last but not least, let's me, let me put you in a very comfortable position asking a question which you are the most comfortable with. That's about predicting your future. <laughs> Oh, yeah. how would you how would you envision the new normal when we are returning to the post-pandemic era how will work look like work look like how will innovation look like how we are going to handle turmoils and what is a new face of leadership well leaders are going to have to get used to developing a new language maybe it's some of that more also male but also decisive but also feminine uh understand deep understanding language as well i don't like the idea of there ever being a normal and for years and years we've talked about having oh this is normal oh things will be back to normal what but what was normal the world was already transforming disrupting new business models new products new technologies new platforms you know hard for a lot of people and organizations to keep up with so i don't know what the new normal is because i just don't think it will be normal maybe the new state is continuing disruption there might be a plateauing i expect look the experts are predicting two different extremes one is nothing will ever be the same again other end of the scale i want my job back i want my life back we're going to go back to it in a month or two. Who is right? I am not the gypsy with the crystal ball, but I would say the truth is likely to be somewhere between the two. Some things will go back to normal. Social gatherings, um, theatre, couple of conferences, <laughs> I hope. A lot of this, but a lot of behaviour that's been changed will not go back to normal. And there will be casualties, there will be disruptions. And I think the leader's job is going to be more and more um, coach, mentor, guide, helping people through the inevitable stress that these changes will create. You know, the core, I hear a lot about it, the word resilience. Um, and it's often just blah, 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 as far as I'm concerned. There are ways, techniques, for getting rid of stress, for actually becoming psychologically and physiologically more resilient. And I see these as playing more and more a part of the well-being of, of, of employees. Not everything is going to change. A lot is. Who knows? It will not be back to normal.
Nigel, thank you so much. I mean, those people who want to explore further and want to hear your wisdom, they can certainly join us at the HR Congress in Valencia. Finger crossed the event. We'll go ahead. We'll see you are exactly you are chairing the conference. Uh, even beyond that, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to contact you? I think you still look at my website. It's dead simple. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, absolutely. Please do. <laughs> it's Nigel Barlow, all one word, N-I-G-E-L, Nigel Barlow at nigelbarlow.com. And there, you know, use old fashioned steam technologies like email or we can Zoom or talk or whatever. And you are also on LinkedIn. Also on LinkedIn. Also on LinkedIn. Yeah. I'm not locked out of LinkedIn. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. So get in touch with Nigel. Join us at the Asia Congress in Valencia, either in a physical or a virtual format. It's definitely one way or another it will take place. And if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thank you very much for tuning in.